Well, good morning. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm Jonathan Dawson with the Psychology of Influence, how to influence instead of alienating your customers. I've got 19 years in automotive. Actually, just two days ago, I celebrated my 19-year anniversary of, of the first car I ever sold. So I'm very excited to be here with you. And in 19 years, I've become a man on a mission. My mission is very simple. I, I want to save the world one salesperson at a time. So it's a small mission, but it's mine. Uh, I'm a raving fan creator. I believe that it's not enough to simply transact with buyers. It's not enough just to sell a car. My goal is to sell a car in such a way that we out-experience our competition and create raving fan advocates in the process. And uh, I'm also a car salesman. I still sell cars. I think I can say I'm one of the few uh, automotive consultants and trainers that can say with a straight face, I actually still do everything I teach at dealerships all across the world. And so everything I'm gonna share with you today comes from very real world experiences from not only myself, but also from the gentleman sharing the stage with me, Will LaGrange. Will, you mic'd up? I think I'm good to go. All right. And uh, my name is William LaGrange. Uh, I'm the general manager at Mackay Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram in Houston, Texas. I've uh, been in the automotive industry for 16 years. I am also a man on a mission. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, and I would like to say that I am a culture creator, uh, especially when it comes to uh, cell college. So there's a third person that's not actually here that wasn't invited and isn't expected to be here, but they're here in spirit, and that's Dr. Robert Cialdini, who wrote a book actually entitled Influence, the Science of Persuasion. And it's really uh, through the model and methodologies that, that Dr. Cialdini shares in that book that many of these examples I'm going to share with you today have been taken from theory and from psychology and applied them to the dealership, to uh, communications online, on the phone, and on the lot with your next customer. So I want to begin actually by asking you to make a promise, and so I'm going to start by making ours. So here's our promise to you, both Will and I promise very simply this. We're going to try in the next 30, 45 minutes the psychology of sales, marketing, and how you can build your business. And our promise to you is we're going to try to give you real world practical techniques that you can implement at your store. In exchange for that, you have a promise back that I'm going to ask you to make. And so your promise is simply that at the end of our presentation that you are going to log into the Digital Dealer app and you're going to uh, review us honestly on the app. Uh, if you have a lot of negative things to say, it's okay. Just please write them in Chinese because my mom can't read Chinese. All right, so do that for me. All right, so let's get into what we're here to talk about, which is how can you influence your next customer? And specifically what I want to talk about is the idea that influence is going to be discussed here in eight primary ways, eight subconscious influencers that you can apply to your next encounter with your customer. The first of the, of the eight that we're going to discuss is the influencer of authority. Now, I do want to set the tone a little bit and make sure, because as I go through the slides, I want you to understand these slides are actually not for you right now. Although they seem like they are, they're not actually for you right now. Because they're actually for the person who's doing this on a playback and watching it and has the ability to hit pause. I'm going to go faster maybe than you're used to. Um, but so just uh, recognize that uh, if you want the entire slide deck, you're certainly welcome to get it. And I'll be happy to pass it on to you. But these are just, again, just to prompt some uh, visual aids and some stories for you. Uh, also, Will is not just a pretty face. Uh, he's the general manager of a dealership uh, in Houston that he recently took over as of last month and in a short period of time has already began to turn it around. He's taken three different stores in different states to number one in their entire state, and he's going to show you how he did that at his dealerships and how you can apply the same principles. But the first thing we want to talk about is the principle of authority. And this is a very basic uh, concept here. The principle of authority simply says that people are going to be influenced by the fact that they trust or respect the credibility of the source telling them that it's either a good deal or a good decision. The higher your authority, the more influence that you have in general. And so when we look at authority, the goal is to elevate the authority of your people and elevate the authority of your dealership in the marketplace. The greater people see you as a trusted resource, the more obviously they're going to be influenced by you in any transaction or marketing message. Now, uh, Will, you actually have a kind of funny, funny story about this. Yeah, well, this is a picture of a few mushrooms and uh, you know, what I like to call the, the mushroom style of management that, that, that many, many dealerships uh, utilize. And that's basically to uh, take your salespeople uh, keep them in the dark, throw a bunch of crap on them, and see how high they grow. And that's pretty normal. That's very normal. But that's not what we're trying to do. Absolutely not. Yeah, so when we look at authority here, we want to look at it in three different ways. Your online authority is how, when a customer is inter interacting with your team online, how do you elevate the authority that they're talking to somebody that they can trust and that somebody they should listen to? 
And so in this very first example here, I want to talk about your online presence that your team has. If I went to your website right now and I clicked on your About Us page or I clicked on your staff page, when I click on that, what am I going to see? You know, many times I go and there's nothing there or there's uh, silhouette images of people. And uh, there's no bio, there's no information, there's nothing that tells me that I should trust you. There's nothing that tells me that, that if I do business with you, I'm in good hands. And so you want to uh, elevate that. Let me give you an example here. So here's a salesperson with their own personal website to promote and grow their authority within the marketplace. And from the website, you can access their blog, you can access their reviews. Uh, there's actually video tutorials on things you can do to uh, program your Bluetooth. Uh, there's all kinds of tips and, and techniques that the customer can get from the salesperson's personal website, which elevates the salesperson as a trusted resource, including, of course, uh, videos of what to expect when you buy a car from them. So we have the online, but what we have next is we have the phone. So when we're using our phone to elevate our authority, I want to share with you something that's, I think, really fascinating use of authority, and it's how to leverage Google as an authority as a salesperson. You know, when you think about authority, I don't think there's anything out there that has more authority in the marketplace than Google. You know, literally, when you don't know what to do, you Google it. When you don't know what to find, you Google it. When you don't know where to go, you Google it. It's the, it's the number one authority, I think, on the planet is you go there for information, you go there for answers. Well, when you teach your salespeople how to leverage Google individually and personally, they become an authority using the tool of Google. And so, in this case here, before you come in, Google me. On the phone with a client, I'm going to show you an example of a salesperson who says, listen, I appreciate that you want to come in tomorrow at 2 o'clock. All I ask is before you come in, you Google me. And gives them the appropriate search term that takes you directly to, in this case, the salesperson's online reviews. This is actually a post from Linda Radu. To date, uh, my understanding is that Linda is the most reviewed, highest reviewed salesperson in the world. There's no other salesperson who comes close. If you have someone at your dealership who challenges Linda, I'd like to know about it. She wrote this post on uh, Facebook and told me about how this one technique has impacted her business so dramatically. She has on her business cards now, don't ask about me, Google me. It's in the signature of every email that goes out. And it's the tagline she says before she hangs up a phone call. Today, it's working. She has 885 personal reviews on, on Dealer Raider alone. Collectively, she has over 1,500 reviews on different review sites. Five star. She's a trusted resource. She's an authority. And then we have at the dealership. And I know, Will, this is, a, a, again, a, a personal thing to you, the language that we use and what we teach our salespeople. Yeah, through Salecology, you know, we, we teach our guys to eliminate any type of uh, negative language and, and replace it with authority-affirming language. Uh, you know, you have to tell your, your sales staff to get, you know, that's not my job, or I, you know, that's, uh, I'll have to get with my manager. You have to get that out of, the, out of their vocabulary and replace it with authority-affirming language, such as, that is my job, or I can get that for you, or I can, I can, I can get that done. Um, also, you know, we, we have what's called uh, EME, which stands for Early Management, Early Management Endorsement, and, and uh, we make it a, a point within the first 10 minutes of a, of a uh, customer arriving on our lot to actually have a manager meet and greet them, um, not only just to say hi, but to, to elevate the salesperson's uh, sense of authority to, well, with the customer. So, uh, you know, basically we let, the, cus we let the, the customer know that they're in great hands with, with the salesperson, that the salesperson knows what he's doing. Uh, that he you know, works basically directly for the general manager and he can get the job done. Yeah, and I think uh, you know, many of you may be familiar with the term of an EMI, an early management introduction, or sometimes even referred to as an intervention. But this is a little bit different. This is an early management endorsement. The goal here is not to simply say, I'm the manager. It's to say, you're with the right person. You don't even need me. It's to endorse and transfer authority to the sales professional themselves. So this is the power of authority, and it's one of the principles that we're going to discuss today. But the next one we're going to discuss is the principle of exemption. Because customers are influenced in different ways, because everyone does have a different way of influence, we have to be willing to both recognize and adapt our approach to match the customer more uniquely and more directly. The principle of exemption is very simple. It's the principle that influences people to buy because they feel in some way they're getting a special deal or they're getting a unique experience, something that's unlike normal people. You've all had a customer that's this way. You recognize this person. When you tell them that um, the, the program is scheduled to end the end of the month, they're the ones that say to you, oh, they'll probably extend them and they're probably going to get better. And you say, you know what, I, I hate to see this car sell since you like it so much. You know, let's lock down this deal today. I mean, if you wait till Monday, I can't guarantee it's going to be here. The exemption person says, well, if it's not here, it wasn't meant to be. 
if you've ever heard that, you're talking to someone who thinks from exemption. They're the ones that always think they're the exception to the rule. And so recognizing that allows you to actually uh, play to that strength and talk to them in a language that matches their way of thinking, which means you have to practice a type of reverse psychology with this person. So online, these people prefer to do di things differently. There are third-party sites and third-party tools, and in fact, the exhibition hall will have several of them. There's even third-party companies that are competing with retail dealerships because they're offering customers a unique or different way to buy a car. The exemption person is the one that's interested in that model. The exemption person is the one that's trying to figure out what do normal people do? I want to do something different. So if you don't get on that train, you're going to miss that segment of the population. If you don't offer a unique and different way to buy a car to the person who wants to quote unquote skip the process or quote unquote get a different way of buying, if you don't offer that, they're going to go somewhere else and possibly to a third party company that uh, is going to offer that for them. On the phone, we do the same thing. We offer to the customer a unique way of doing business. And the goal is to say, hey, listen, when you come here, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to do something for you that's very unique and special. And sometimes, like I said, when you recognize these things earlier, it allows you to just frame everything you offer in light of their influence. And it causes that person to respond very positively. Let me show you an example of that. In this video, what I'm doing is I took an inbound phone call, a lady named Stephanie, who was looking for a car for her son, who expressed to us that she hates the car buying experience and process. And so immediately after the phone call ended, I did a quick video with a gentleman, Randy. Hi there, Stephanie, Jonathan Dawson, and? Randy Brady, the car all star. That's exactly right. And the, uh, we just wanted to send you this quick video. We spoke earlier today about a vehicle for Cameron. We've been fantastically busy here at the store, but I wanted to take a minute to do a quick introduction. Randy will be the gentleman that'll meet with you tomorrow morning when you come in at 10. Awesome. And, and he's gonna also do another video for you to look at um, with some more information. So you're gonna get that uh, later, but we wanted to get you something right away. So say bye to Stephanie. Then bye immediately Stephanie. after right, that video bye. was sent, Randy, the salesperson, rolls out the red carpet, puts a bow on the car, turns that image into a meme, and sends that directly to Stephanie. Now keep in mind, Stephanie's trying to buy a car for her son. As soon as Stephanie receives this message, she responds back to Randy and says, will the car still look like that when we get there? She's excited to come see the vehicle with her son. You want to leverage this stuff online, on the phone, and of course at your dealership. And so I know that, again, Will, this is where another cr critical step where the language comes in and how you communicate to people who are exemption buyers. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, obviously you need to look for clues to, to find those individuals that, or to, to, to find out who those individuals are that are influenced by the exemption principle. But uh, if and when you do, you need to make sure that you, you, you talk in terms of, of exclusivity. Um, and that, you know, that they are, um, you know, an exception to the rules. So, you know, certain word tracks such as, you know, we don't usually just do this for everyone, but, uh, or we can do this for you, but please don't say anything to anybody else. Uh, just making them feel like, like they're the exception to the rule. Absolutely. The next principle we're going to discuss is the principle of obligation. And this principle of, of reciprocity and obligation uh, is also a very powerful one in psychology. And it's based on a very simple idea that, that people will be influenced to buy from you and feel obligated to buy from you based on the value they've received or the effort that was given. This is uh, very, very powerful. When, when you do something for somebody, especially something that's unexpected, it causes a subconscious reaction in the mind where they go, wow, I didn't expect you to do that. That was very kind of you. I didn't know you would do that or you would do that for me. And when a person feels that emotion a couple of times within an, an experience like buying a car, they start to feel like a schmuck if they then decide they're gonna shop you. They start to feel like, how can I, how can I ignore all the effort these people went through to take care of me? It just makes it harder for the person to walk away from the deal or to not, in this case, maybe keep an appointment. And so online, uh, offering to prepare the vehicle prior to their arrival, I mentioned this a little bit when it came to the principle of obligation, but Will, you use this at your dealership as well. Yeah, we do, and, and uh, the principle of obligation and reciprocity is, is about adding uh, unexpected value, adding enough value uh, where, whereas the other dealerships aren't, so to speak. And um, you know, one of the things we do, there's a picture right there, um, is uh, we actually have a few red carpets and, and velvet ropes uh, when, when we have an appointment that we know is going to be coming in to look at a vehicle. Uh, we'll actually lay a red carpet out and some, and some velvet ropes to make it look like it's a, you know, a true VIP experience. And you know, I know that you know, many dealerships don't do anything like that. They don't even have the cars pulled up, but you know, I think it goes a long way and it adds a lot of unexpected value when say, you're, the, you're the only dealership that's actually laying out the red carpet for a customer. Yeah, imagine the client has three appointments, three different places they're intending on going. They've already been to one and then they come to you and just for an appointment, they see this. 
And when they walk up and see this experience, they start comparing this to the dealership they were just at. And if they decide to go to the next dealership, they start thinking when they get to the next store, because oftentimes they get there and then what? They, you know, the, no gas in the car, battery's dead, can't find the keys. And the customer starts thinking, man, look at how much effort these people put in. Here's another example I think is, illustrates it even better. So here is an example of an inbound call where the salesperson is talking to the customer and discovers that the reason they're in the market is because his fiance is having a birthday and she's buying a car for her birthday. So he's scheduling the appointment and they're going to go look at some cars. Now, in this case, the sales professional knowing this takes advantage of this opportunity and stages the car this way without the client knowing. So when they show up for their appointment, they don't expect to see this. And as soon as they get out of the car, this is, this is their first impression of the vehicle. There's a birthday card waiting for them, the sign, the balloons, and the whole thing is set up. So you can imagine then when Anne is there looking at a car for the first time and she sees this experience, coupled with all the other great things the dealership does, it makes it very hard for them to then beat you up on the price. It makes it very hard for them to just try to figure out how to get a better deal from down the road. Because you've created reciprocity, people feel obligated to respond and to do business with you. And I, I know a lot of dealerships also are getting better at this, but offering to do documentation and take care of paperwork prior to the customer's arrival. The goal is to try to get as many times as possible with the customer's mindset. Get the customer to say something like, you can do that? I didn't know you could do that. I didn't expect you to do that. I didn't know you would do that for me. You would do that for me. If they can respond that way two to three times, psychologically, it triggers reciprocity in their heart. And they start feeling like, wow, this is, this is, uh, this is such different experience than I expected. You guys are awesome, and I feel like I owe you my business. At the dealership, I'll show you an example of a salesperson taking ownership over this philosophy and staging a gift box, boxes and bags for their customers. Again, this is an example of, of something he's giving to a customer who's coming in on an appointment. So remember, the goal is to leverage reciprocity so the customer wants to buy from you and doesn't feel like they have to beat you up. So these are the things that you're doing prior to the customer ever coming to the point of making a purchase decision. So in this case here, as you can see in the, in the image, he has a staged box and he's got a discount card. It's called Ben Does It Right card. He had these custom cards made up. They look like credit cards. And he actually has relationships with local businesses around his dealership where you can present the Ben Does It Right card and get discounts at sandwich shops and get free bag of chips and all kinds of things that he's set up all around the dealership area. And then when you show up for your appointment, he's got this stage for you and he gives it as a gift just for keeping your appointment. So when you start stacking these influencers on top of each other, you realize the power that they begin to have in a sales process. The next one we're going to discuss is the principle of liking and familiarity. Now this principle here is very common again. We understand these things. This is not new material, but it's just understanding how to apply these things to our sales process so our people are consistent successes instead of accidental successes. You have people on your sales team right now that are an accidental success with every customer. They have moments of brilliance followed by moments of utter insanity. And they, they forget how to sell a car sometimes. And you look at them and say, you know, you've been doing this for more than a month, bro. Time to like figure this stuff out. But they, they literally don't recognize the patterns of what causes someone to buy. And so they think it's luck. But this is the principle that influences people to buy because they feel a connection or a common ground to either the person or the product. We all would rather do business with people that we like. We would all rather do business with things that we feel comfortable with or have a commonality with. It makes it feel easier. That's why brand loyalty and product loyalty is so uh, easy to establish. Once a customer likes your product, they don't want to change. It's the same principle here. We're just trying to apply that to the salesperson themselves. I call this sometimes the Barney principle. How many of you remember Barney? I love you. We're a... Come on. If you don't sing this one, I'll do the shark song. Do you want me to do the shark? Do, 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 do? Yeah, I can do it. The Barney principle is really simple. You know, it's, hey, I love you. You love me. We're a happy family. The same principle needs to be applied when selling. You see, I have to let the customer know that I love you, I like you, I like working with you. The customer needs to feel that they're liked and appreciated. But in the reverse, we also need the customer to like us and to, to, to love us and to want to do business with us. And then building that rapport and that common ground is that family component. And so online, the way that you do that again is you send videos or provide a link again to the bio page or personal website where you feature the salesperson. All right, so in this video, you're seeing again, this is uh, Eric Cash's personal homepage. And from this video page here, he's actually uh, doing kind of an, in, an informal introduction to himself, talking about how he got in the business, why he got in the business, 
uh, the things that, that he does for his customers, what you can expect from him, and it really kind of tells a little bit of his backstory. And when you learn this about Eric, you really start to bond with the guy. You start to feel like, here's a person that, that I'm going to enjoy working with. Here's a person that I think I would enjoy having as my salesperson. I went to Olive Branch High School, so I've been here 20 plus years. I got a wonderful girlfriend I've been with for four years, going on five here in June. Uh, we just had our wonderful daughter. Her name's Courtney, December 11th. She's nine weeks today. Um, she's precious, so she's my everything. It's my first time actually being in a car business. Uh, my girlfriend told me that, hey, you're really good with people. Uh, you have great people skills. You can talk about anything. Uh, so I decided to give it a shot, and it's a wonderful place to be. Uh, so there, it's a great experience for me here, and I don't think I can go anywhere that's any better than this place here. I go the extra mile for my customers, and I'm willing to stay with them as long as possible. I will never give up on them. Uh, if they're in a tough situation, I'm willing to work through it. I'm willing to work with them to get them the best deal possible. I want my customers to say that Eric was a very professional um, salesperson, that he, he was very honest, he was friendly, he was fun, he was silly, he made the car buying experience the best that they ever had. On your team right now, how many of your people have videos like this set up? Videos that feature them, their family, videos that feature their hobbies, their interests, giving opportunities for a customer to connect with them on a personal level. Many dealerships don't have anything like this. You don't have it on your About Us page, your staff page. There's no way that the customer can feel a liking or connection with your team because we're not featuring why you should like them and why you should connect with them. The next one, of course, is on the phone. I have a little bit of a controversial stance on phone calls. I actually think that most calls are too short. Uh, if you listen to many people, they talk about trying to get the call two minutes or less, and that's effectively what happens. You have a call. Do you have the car? Yes, I have the car. When would you like to come in and look at it? I can be there maybe this Thursday. Great. I have 315 or 415. What works for you? And then all of a sudden, you set what you think is an appointment. And what I'm suggesting is no rapport can be established in two minutes. None of these influencers can be established in two minutes. Uh, what you want to do is you want to extend the call a little bit longer than that because you want to teach your people how to actually create relationship with people, to find out what the customer's goals are, what they're trying to accomplish and why. And if your people can begin to connect with them on a much more personal level, then it, they stop seeing it as a transactional process. I think the industry has switched to uh, transactional for a lot of dealers, but I'm against that. I'm about relationship. I'm about creating raving fan advocates. I'm about out experiencing the competition. I think that's where profitability can be uh, gained and retained in this marketplace if we make our people lovable. At the dealership, allowing your salespeople to brand themselves and build a following. Will's got some unique examples of that he wanted to share. Yeah, well, this is uh, these are two photos here. Uh, the guy on the on your left, uh, his name is Josh Frank, and he goes by. He's got a personal brand. He, he called himself the Candy Man because he gives out the sweetest deal. And uh, you know, every time you know, every time he has a jet, he's got those little jars of candy that he likes to give out. And, and, uh, and he has a good time with it, and the customers love it. And the customers love it. Um, also, have another guy, and, and his entire office is, is is filled with pictures of happy customers that uh, have came before, have came come before. And, and he goes, he, he brands himself as the people's champ because he fights for the best deals. And, and those are just two examples of of, of uh, uh, personal branding that these these guys have used in order to kind of you know let the sales let the customers you know help like them uh, even faster. That's exactly right. So we've talked about how these influences work, and there's actually four more that we're going to address. And all of these begin to stack together, compounding on top of each other, and create a, an experience for the customer where you reduce friction, you reduce the back and forth, you create a much more compliant and flexible and reasonable buyer, and ultimately increase profitability and production. This is a part of the principles that Will has used to take three different stores to number one in their state. Uh, it's by using these principles and teaching their salespeople how to actually connect on a deeper emotional and psychological level with your buyers. The next one is social proof. Social proof is a very, again, common principle. We understand that people will be influenced when they see what other people are doing. And if they see that other people are doing something, they feel more safe or secure that it's a good, wise, or, uh, or a great decision. So leveraging social proof means that you're going to cause customers to see that other people trust you. And one of the ways that I'm going to show you to do this that, that I don't think most dealerships are utilizing is utilizing social media live tools to cause the story of your sale to go viral. So let me show you an example of what that looks like. And I'm going to give you three different video clips. But what I want you to see is this is a perspective from the salesman's perspective. He just sold a car. His name is Matt. He just sold a car. And across uh, from him at his desk are two clients who just bought the car. And he's actually going Facebook Live at his desk interviewing his customer. This, this is the man with all the power right there. I'm not ready. Hey, John, you're also live. 
<laughs> on Matt and Mia's yeah. Facebook page. So, how do I flip this? Do you know? Uh, this one. Oh, right in the no, middle? No, no. Over, left. This guy? Tag. Left. No. Tag. The other left. <laughs> Got it. No, no. That was the left. There. Oh, the that camera. one. Got it. That was actually the best part, I think, right there <laughs> of the live so, video. So, good news. Nicole's here, too. Okay. Hi. And we just hung out with a pretty awesome guy who put us into a pretty sweet minivan because that's how we roll, right? <laughs> we still got the three kids in back. We checked out of the sedan. Not going to work, right? Maybe one day, probably a decade from now. But today, this man right here, <laughs> <laughs> who's going live on a separate feed, Matt and Mia, right? You look at the sign here. Well, I'll take you. Right? It's backwards on Facebook, but it's fine. You got it. So, but he hooked us up. We highly recommend the experience. Totally laid back and showed us all the cool features. Now these people have never gone Facebook Live before. They don't know what they're doing, but he asked them to. So that video in a week got 127 views on the salesman's profile, but this is where it gets very interesting and the compounding effect of using these tools. This is the same experience from the customer's perspective. So this is the customer's phone as he was holding it. This. You, now, you probably know better. We're, we're say, live, Matt. Can you, go, <laughs> can you go this way or this way? I, I don't I know if so. it goes. Yeah, so this this is what happens when you come see Matt and Mia. Look at this. It's pers get a, get personalized get M &Ms Matt and Mia M&M's. Are you live right now? Yeah. Yeah, milk, chocolate, candies. But do you know this This is the man with all the power right there. <laughs> so Mia is Matt's puppy. <laughs> So Matt does co-branding of himself, Matt, so, uh, with his puppy Mia, this, you know? and everything is branded uh, Matt and Mia, and Mia comes to the dealership all the time, and Matt specifically targets people who love dogs, and he builds a connection with people, in this case, this family. So the, the husband went live at the exact same time the salesman did. A week later, within the same window of time, he got 1,000 views and 23 shares. The customer's video had 1,000 views and 23 shares. The salesman had 127 views. The customer had 1,000 in the same window of time. The next morning, the wife came in to pick up the car, and here's what happened. All right, folks, we are picking up our new car, and look at Lexi. She is in Matt's Tundra. Hi. Hi, Sadie, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, go show us the new car, Sade. So you can see, in this case, the wife actually went live the next day and got an additional 500 views. These are people who have never gone live before in their life. But the reason they went live is because Matt said, all of my customers are doing this for me now. Social proof. Would you do this too? They said, sure. And he collected between two people, 1,500 views of a single sale. Most of your time, what happens at your dealership is when you guys sell a car, if a salesperson sells a car, typically who knows that a car was sold? Well, he knows or she knows, the manager knows, the finance manager knows, the porter knows, the customer knows. And of those people, who's going to buy a car again in the next week or two weeks or month? None of them. So what happens is you have an experience one time that's not being shared using social proof. And therefore, it limits the exposure and it limits the, the ability for the salesperson's business to grow. So another example is to use on the phone social, uh, social language to build consensus. Teaching salespeople to share you know, whatever it is about your dealership that makes you guys the best. The reason why you're the number one whatever in your market. You know, the reason why so many customers buy from you. So saying things like, here's the reason why many customers do decide to shop with us. Here's why we get feedback. Here's why customers tell us they do business with us. Here's why we're ranked number one in our market. So what happens is when you start using this language of number one in our market, most customers choose us. This is why so many people just decide to do business with us. Is it creates social uh, proof in the mind of the buyer, telling them it's a safe decision to do business because so many other people do it as well. Uh, Will, you guys actually have an evidence manual that you use to help customers close customers. Yeah, we have an evidence manual. We call it a, a review binder, but uh, every one of our salespeople uh, has just a, a, a small binder that they keep at their desks. Um, and uh, the time in between uh, when they go get their, their, their proposals from, from management, they, uh, they actually ask their, uh, their customers if they would mind reading their review binder. And the review binder basically consists of uh, sheets of paper that previous customers have written letters of recommendation on. Um, and it, it's, it's a great time to, first of all, fill the void, uh, the five or ten minutes that it takes for, to, to get the, the, the proposal from, from management. But at the same time, the customer is reading all these great reviews 
uh, you know, peer peer reviews that say, you know, how good of a salesperson, you know, Johnny is, and you know that Johnny will treat you right, and you got to do business with Johnny. And, and we found that it really puts customers at ease. Um, you know, it makes them feel like they're they're getting ready to do business with with a salesperson that is a good person to do business. And it's so simple because you know it, it's a cycle. You know, they we show them the review binder. And um, when, when we earn their business, then that customer will write, will, will therefore write another review. And, and you get the snowball. It just keeps getting bigger. It's a snowball. Effect. Absolutely. The next principle is the contrast principle. This is a very interesting principle in psychology. It basically has to do with the way we think about things uh, in relation to others. So in this case here, the principle that influences people to buy because of how the deal or the opportunity compares to what they expected or a previous offer that was given. It's uh, basically looking for clues based on previous experiences or based on things around it. So if I ask you right now in the room right now, does this uh, blue box, does this look like a big blue box, yes or no? No. Now does it look like a big blue box? Sure. Now does it look like a big blue box? No. So in this case, what's the thing that changes? The environment or how it's being compared or contrasted? Whenever you uh, compare or contrast things properly, you cause a person to feel influenced by the information that you're giving compared to what they've already gotten or to compared to the experience or what they expected. So let me give you an example of that. On your website online, how well do you define what are commonly referred to in marketing as your USPs or your unique selling propositions? The things that cause you to stand out compared to other dealerships that you might shop with. Here's one of my clients, a uh, used car dealership. And uh, so on their website, they have their common questions tab. And whenever their internet department, BDC, or sales team is talking to a customer who starts asking one of these common questions, the salesperson will take a direct link from the common questions page and send it to them to begin to answer what makes us different or unique. So here we have the top 10 questions. And one of the questions is about their money back guarantee and how it works. And so they actually provide a very clear Statement, if for any reason you have second thoughts about your purchase, you can return the car within three days for a full refund as long as you've drove it for less than 500 miles and there's no damage on the vehicle. Buy it, drive it, love it, or return it. That's their promise. There's also a short video from the owner talking about why he provides this promise to his clients and a full detailed explanation of the three-day money-back guarantee. How well do you define your unique selling proposition and how you're different and what you do to contrast or compare yourself to others in the marketplace? On the phone, I know, Will, you use contrast uh, with your BDC and, and salespeople when it comes to appointments. Well, we do. We know that um, the contrast principle it basically states that when, when offered something unreasonable, an, in, an individual is, is, or something less unreasonable, the customer is usually inclined to, to choose the less unreasonable uh, thing. So, uh, especially when we're trying to set appointments on the phone, we use the contrast principle. So, you know, instead of asking a, a close-ended question such as, hey, when would be a good time for you to come in, we like to offer uh, an, an unreasonable choice uh, followed by a more reasonable choice. So something better to the effect of, when would be a good time for you to come in, can you come in right now, i.e. unreasonable, or would maybe later this, op this afternoon work better for you, or would maybe tomorrow morning work better for you. And we found that, uh, you know, instead of asking a closed-ended question, which you don't get a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, results off of, you know, if you offer that, can you drop everything you're doing right now, come on in, or would later this afternoon work best for you, the, the, they typically choose the, the more reasonable, which would be later the afternoon. Absolutely. So, uh, at the dealership, uh, I'm going to share with you an example that I use that's very unique on how I help salespeople get referrals. I think most of your salespeople that do a good job would love to see an increase in their referral business and would love to see uh, the ability to get more referral leads from every sale. The contrast principle is one of the ways that I teach salespeople to get hundreds if not thousands more actual referral leads in a given month. And this is a video sent to me by one of my GMs uh, because his salespeople was using the contrast principle to start getting actual referral leads. I'm referring to names and cell phone numbers given to a salesman at point of sale. That's what I mean by when I say a referral. The actual customer writes down and hands them to the salesperson. And this is what the manager sent me. So how many did you get, big boy? 560 referrals. God, look, Jonathan, I mean, I don't understand you've been doing this for this long. We've only been doing it like less than a month. And we keep smashing, smashing your record. I don't get it. What's the deal, Jonathan? It's just his really 561 at Peoria Ford. Tell your other dealers to try to keep up. So the contrast principle when it comes to referrals is really a simple request. Normally what would happen is a salesperson would ask the question, do you know anybody else that's in the market for a car that I could help?
and they basically ask for like a name or two. And the customer almost always says, I can't think of anybody right now, but if I think of somebody, I'll let you know. And then the salesman hands out business cards, which never come back. And entire forests are being deforested by business cards that get handed out that never come back. And so instead, what I teach them to use is to use the contrast request, which means you have to frame what you want in light of something else that makes the customer go, I can't do that, but I can do this. And so I actually teach them to start by asking for 100 names and numbers from a customer that just bought a car. And the request sounds something like this. I might say, you know, sir, if you like the way that I did business with you today, what I'd like you to do is to help me out. Here's a sheet of paper. I'd like you to write down 100 names and numbers of people that you think would like me and the way I do business. And if you can't do 100 because it seems like a lot, I would take 50. But since you really like me, I'm not going to let you leave without giving me at least a solid 25. So I'll give you some time and here's a paper. Go to town. And when you frame the request, I need 100, I'll take 50, but you can't leave without giving me 25. It's amazing how many people will bust out 25 names and numbers. Because the contrast to what you originally asked for panics them and makes them go, oh my God, how am I going to give you 100? And then when you release the valve of pressure by offering the 50 and then the 25, they actually feel compelled to do the 25. And you can get your first list of 25. And some salespeople, 30-year veterans say, just doing that one technique, I've gotten from one customer more names and numbers, more referral leads, more introductions than I've gotten all last year off of one sale. The last two are going to be the commitment and scarcity, and then we're going to offer you some options uh, for some questions. But the commitment principle is based on the idea that, that some people are influenced to buy because they feel they have to follow through with their previous or current commitments or uh, that you have honored your commitment. Now, the commitment principle is a unique principle because it doesn't apply to that many people. And in fact, in society, fewer and fewer people keep their commitments. It's actually a smaller portion of the population. But when you have a commitment-based buyer, it's very important that you understand them and that you offer your offer in such a way that it resonates and connects with them. So I know that you have an interesting story about making clear and uh, concise promises uh, from one of your salespeople, Will. Yeah, well, when, we, when dealing with someone that's influenced with, uh, by the principle of commitment and consistency, the first thing you need to do really is look for clues to see who those types of individuals typically are. Um, yeah, typically, you can look. You need to look for uh, typical some types of careers. People that are in the military or in, or uh, in police. Um, also, you know, look to see uh, how long someone has been married uh, or how long they've been on their job. Uh, obviously, people that have been on, been married for a long time or they've been on their job for a long time, uh, or people even people with good credit scores. Uh, you can tell they're probably going to be influenced by this principle. Um, also, certain age demographics, older people typically, uh, tend to value commitment and consistency, say, more than uh, the, younger, the younger generation. But, yeah, this is a picture of a salesperson, uh, just for illustration purposes, but a picture of a salesperson eating lunch on his, on his lunch break. And this is actually a story that, uh, about something that happened uh, as soon as I took over a dealership. Uh, we had a, uh, a, a, an appointment, a customer uh, had set an appointment with a, uh, with a salesperson uh, and the salesperson told the customer that, uh, that he would have the vehicle uh, pulled up uh, at the, in front of the dealership, gassed up, ready to go. Um, and um, so, so let's just say for two, at two o'clock and well, two o'clock rolls by and you know, five minutes before two o'clock, of course, this customer comes uh, strolling in the dealership and the, and the salesperson's nowhere to be found. Um, you know, come to find out this, this, this customer was, was heavily, heavily influenced by uh, the principles of commitment and consistency. You know, he was, a, he was an older gentleman, uh, he was ex-military, had a Vietnam hat, Vietnam hat on, and, you know, he wanted to know, you know, why was this, why was the car not pulled up, where was the salesperson, um, you know, why didn't the salesperson follow through on his commitment to uh, have the vehicle ready, and, ready to go and, and at the exact time that he said he was. So. Uh, you know, obviously, I had a, a heck of a time trying to overcome uh, the the, um, the bitterness that that, that, that customer had, uh, and it's just basically an illustration to show you that you know if you're dealing with someone that is uh, heavily influenced by commitment and consistency, when you say that you're going to do something for that customer, you better make sure that you do it. Yeah, in the case of this gentleman, uh, the salesperson assumed most people don't keep their appointment, so he decided to run across the street to Whataburger and get a burger. Uh, right around two o'clock, thinking the customer's probably going to be late, so it won't matter. Uh, and the customer wasn't late, and the customer ended up leaving upset. And this kind of stuff happens all the time, and we miss opportunities in sales. 
Uh, also, when you're on the phone with a commitment person, uh, it's really important to ask for micro commitments because uh, high commitment people are reluctant to make commitments because they know whatever they say they have to follow through on. So you've had clients like this before that when you try to get them any kind of commitment or close, they're very reluctant. In fact, they're the, they're the classic scenario of the, we never buy the first place out. And, and you can sense, uh, again, sometimes that's just a line. And other times when you're talking to somebody who's been married for 30 years, was in the military, union worker, you know, lived in the same house for 25 years, these are people that when they say something, they plan on following through. And, and, and so if you try to convince them against their will, uh, they stay they stay of the same opinion still, and then they then they see you differently. So learning how to speak to a, a commitment buyer in a way that resonates with them and makes them see that you value the fact that they're going to keep their word uh, makes you more influential with that buyer. So I, I, one of the phrases I like to use is, "All I'm asking for is five percent of your trust. Let me earn the rest," and asking for that micro commitment there. And as you continue through the process with these people, they continue to move down one step further towards the sale. Also, um, at your dealership, if you have a, a longevity story at your dealership, if you have a lot of things you do for your community or a lot of things you do for your customers, these types of buyers are heavily influenced by how you serve the community and what you do for other people. And so making sure that you weave that into your story or your dealership tour, make sure the customer senses that you are committed to your community and your customers, and that will influence them to commit to you and to do business with you. The last one is simply scarcity. And this one is obviously one of the most abused and used tactics in all of the car business, right? It's the car's going to sell, you're going to miss out, the program's going to end. And when it works, it works. But when it doesn't work, it's a train wreck. Because if you're dealing with an exemption buyer and you try to use this, you don't influence, you, you alienate and annoy these people. But for scarcity, it's simply the principle that says that people want to buy because they don't want to miss out on a deal or an opportunity. And we've all had clients like this that that they come in and you tell them, look, I'd hate for you to miss out on the car, and they say, you know what, you're right, and they buy it. That's a scarcity-minded person. When they arrive at the dealership and they start asking questions right away, like, when do the programs end? When they say that, when are these programs scheduled to end, they're saying that because they're afraid they'll miss out on something. So learning and teaching your people how to recognize these patterns allows your team to make sure that they're using the right influencer with the right customer to influence instead of alienate and annoy. When you do this online, it's letting customers know who are shopping online that they can protect their time and the vehicle that they're interested in. Uh, Will, at your store, how do you do that? Well, we uh, offer a scheduled hold deposit. Um, you know, if we, if we know that someone's going to be influenced by that principle, you know, we'll, we'll say, hey, listen, would you like to go ahead and, and put a deposit on the vehicle that we can hold? And, uh, you know, obviously, if, if, you, if we don't do that, then we can't hold the vehicle, and, 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 and there is a good chance that the vehicle still might sell. And, and for the scarcity buyer, when they hear that, they start saying, okay, I want to lock it down. If a customer doesn't respond to that, they're not scarcity-minded, which means they might be influenced by higher authority, they might be influenced by exemption, but you need to stop trying to use scarcity with somebody if they're not scarcity-minded. Also, I have a dealer client that offers to bring the vehicle directly to the client as well. So if the appointment is within 24, 48 hours, what they'll do is they'll say, listen, one thing that we offer our customers who have found a vehicle that they want and have been looking for a long time and don't want to lose the vehicle is we'll actually take the vehicle directly to your house. If you have a vehicle that you would like to have appraised, we'll bring your vehicle to the dealership and we'll wash it for you. That way, when you come in, you'll leave with a washed up, cleaned up car either way. But while your vehicle's here, you get to enjoy the vehicle. It protects anybody else from buying it. And on our end, we'll have your vehicle and we'll have plenty of time to get it appraised uh, and, and looked at. If the customer jumps on that offer, that's, again, a scarcity-minded person who doesn't want to miss out and lose the deal. And then, of course, at the dealership, the most classic use of scarcity is simply the takeaway, is to say, you know what, folks, maybe this isn't the right car, maybe this isn't the right deal. Um, you know what, um, I, I know that we have somebody else that's interested in this car, so maybe we should just let them have the car and you guys can find something else. And for the customer who's scarcity-minded, this freaks them out and they come back to the table. And most of us, especially sales managers in the room, can relate to using this effectively. So we've all tried this before. We've all tried certain closes with certain customers that completely backfire and certain closes with other customers that work like a charm. We've all had a salesman try to convince a customer of something only to have the manager come in two minutes later and say the same thing that the salesman was saying and they believe the manager because they believe higher authority. We've also had managers come in and alienate the customer because the customer's not influenced by you being a manager and you're trying to use the manager card and they could care less. So recognizing these patterns gives you an ability, whether it's scarcity, whether it's authority, whether it's contrast, to always try to figure out what is in the mind of my client and how do I make sure that I'm speaking their language. So here's some final thoughts as you wrap up the session as we get into the Q&A. 
So first of all, do you agree that success and influence comes from knowing how people are wired and recognizing that everybody's in fact wired differently? Do you recognize yourself in some of these examples? As we gave these eight influencers, do you recognize that when you shop for something, that some of these influence you more than others? Do you recognize your customers in these examples? And would you say that it makes sense to help your salespeople better understand your customer in general? Tony Robbins said it best, I think, when he said, the best way to influence somebody is to find out what already influences them and then to speak to them in that language. And when you speak to somebody in the language that they're already influenced by, it increases your ability to influence them. And now we have a few minutes for the Q&A, and so I'd like to open it up for that. If somebody has some questions about a specific application or about some of the notes that you took, and we could try to address those at this time. Yes, ma'am? Yes? Yeah, so the question, as I understand it, is experimenting with Facebook Live and not just going live from the dealership's page or the salesman's page, but actually having the customer do it. And what successes have we had? It's been phenomenal. In fact, it's, it's actually interesting that the, the customer's live streams, on average, are getting more views and engagement than the dealership's page live stream is getting. You would think they'd have considerably more reach, but it's actually not, not showing up to be the case at all. And it'd be fascinating if somebody from Facebook could explain that to me. But like I showed you in, the indication, in that one example, that's actually fairly common. The salesman goes live, gets 127 views. The customers go live and get 1,523 shares. I think that uh, I think for some reason when, when people see their friends and family going live, it's such a unique experience. Very few people have done it. In fact, almost every time when I ask a customer, have you gone live before, they almost always say no. And so this would be the first time they're going live. And so I think when they go live and, the, and then their friends and family see that they're going live and they bought a car, then there's, I guess, the, uh, the interaction and the engagement on that. It's, it's quite fascinating, and it's easy, and it's free. Everyone should be doing it. So the question is, is there much hesitation? I would say there's, there, there is sometimes hesitation, but again, it goes back to the way you've influenced the customer up to this point. So if you've influenced them, like, for example, um, my questions leading up to the, to the live, this is the way I asked for the live. So this is a principle called the commitment principle I referred to earlier, where I'm going to get a bunch of micro commitments. So I might ask this way. I might say, based on your experience working with me today, if you had any friends or family that were ever in the market for a car, would you feel comfortable recommending and endorsing me? And you would say, sure. And I'd say, and out of everybody that you know in your network, how many of them do you think would like me and the way I do business? It's usually not a handful. It's usually everybody. <laughs> you don't know me that well, but I'm incredibly likable. Okay, so the answer is everybody. But usually they say, you know what, probably everybody I know would like you. And I say, great, would you be willing to do me a personal favor and help me out on a project I'm working on? And they say, sure. Would you be willing to introduce an endorsement to your friends and family if I showed you how? And they say, yeah, what do, you, what do you want to do? I say, let's go Facebook Live. Have you ever done it before? And they go, no. I say, it's easy, I'll show you. My customers started doing this for me recently. And that's it. Okay, you're allowed to, so you're good. Yeah. Well, in this case, you're on their channel, <laughs> so you don't even need an authorization because you're actually streaming from their account, right? You're not using them for promotional purposes. They're using you, so you're actually exempt, All right? Uh, maybe another question or two. I think somebody had one back here. Yes, sir? Well, I've been, with, I've been using Cellcology for about... Four, about four years now. We're going into our fifth year. Um, and when I go into it, when I when I go into a, a new store, I'll, I'll bring Cellcology with me, and I start at day one. And um, I mean, what I found is that uh, that every single place that I've gone to, the salespeople really take to it. Uh, it really speaks to them. They see it as something that they that, that, that is something incredibly different, something that they've never seen before, a different way of thinking on how to sell on how to sell vehicles. Uh, as far as as far as bringing a team with me, no. Uh, my most recent move, I did bring two two sales managers with me, but not salespeople. Um, and um, uh, on my most recent move here in Houston, uh, the salespeople are excited about Cellcology, just like they just like the salespeople were at my previous dealership. So one thing I've really found is that is that the salespeople really take to it, and they really see it as something that they can relate to, and they get excited about it. He's asking if there's any, do you also provide accountability or is it just uh, immediate adoption and they just take and run? Well, no, um, you know, what we, what we do is when we, when we start the training program, we'll, we'll watch videos, to, we'll watch the videos together, we'll discuss them, talk about them, and then we'll, we'll ask them if they can try to implement 
whatever whatever it is that we watched or whatever it was that we were learning about that day, we'll ask them to see if they can try to implement it, you know, in their daily practices. Um, and uh, and they do. But yeah, I, yeah, of course I hold them. I try to hold them accountable. I say, listen, guys, I really want y'all to, to stress this. I want you to stress that. Or if we're studying about you know certain principle, I, I just want them to, you know, I'll say, hey, listen, throughout the day, I just want you to be aware and you know of, of when you're dealing with a customer like this, or if you're dealing with a customer that is influenced by you know this behavior or this principle, and um, and they did. It's all about recognizing patterns, and so once you teach people to recognize the patterns of behaviors, they become much more um, intuitive and much more intentional. Yeah, and the behaviors become yeah much more predictable on both sides, the salesman and the customer. Well, listen, uh, as far as time goes, you guys have been very generous with it. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Thank you for your patience and grace. I did ask you to review me. If you're going to say super negative things, please do it in Chinese like you, like you promised. And everybody else, thank you so much for your time. I will be available over here if you have any further questions. Appreciate your time. Thank you.